This is the OGM weekly call for Thursday, October 12th, 2023. Um, it kind of sort of a somber time because Hamas attacked Israel last Friday, I guess, or Saturday morning. Friday morning or Saturday morning, Israeli time. It was Saturday. Somewhere there. Saturday morning, I think. I think. I don't know. It's all mushed together these days. Yeah. And everything's happened really quickly. So it's changing a lot of stuff. Changing a lot of assumptions on the ground, I think. Um, last time we talked, uh, we kicked around this topic of storytelling and narratives and stuff like that. Uh, that felt like a very nice uh, excursion, but still a very OGME subject. Sort of like, what about stories? The power of stories, storytelling tools, whatever, whatever comes up. Uh, and I figured that would be a great way to focus on stuff. The I think the most recent story I've heard uh, that got me excited was actually uh, a video that Jack Conti recorded about. Uh, how they have upgraded uh, Patreon. So Patreon's been through a major makeover that I really like. And uh, this video is amusing, informative, skillfully created from, there's a camera overhead, there's a camera over here. He's a musician, he loops in some music, other kinds of stuff. So it's, it's very highly produced, but he's using a, an app called something like Endless Paper, which is uh, very Prezi-like. Uh, and he sets it up on a huge monitor in front of him. So whenever, you, whenever you want, uh, it's a really lovely example of how to how to how to talk about something really pragmatic, like, "Hey, we redesigned our our system and uh, keep going." Hey, Doug. Hey, Hank. Um, I just pasted. I'll paste it again. I, I just pasted a link in the chat uh, of a video that just came out pretty recently uh, by the founder of Patreon explaining upgrades and changes and a, a big makeover to the system. And I just really enjoyed it. I enjoyed it the way I enjoyed Annie Leonard's The Story of Stuff, which is if, if I had to come up with one example, like in the moment uh, to tell people about it, it would probably be Annie Leonard's Story of Stuff because that's a, that's a highly, highly skilled narrative that I think I, I read somewhere cost like $130,000 to create. Um, that was the, the the level of investment needed to come up with a, a video with an animation that she could stand in uh, telling uh, that kind of story. So let me pause for a second and see what uh, what direction anybody would like to take it in or anything you'd like to throw on the table. Well, one thing that I've thought is that any scientific enterprise or technical enterprise, which purport in a way to be narrative free, are always embedded in a narrative of some kind. Now, there's no science paper that doesn't have a narrative implicit behind it. But we just don't teach people to be conscious of what they're doing and how to do it better. Um, you're reminding me of a couple of things. One is that there are some efforts to do better communication, like Alan Alda has made a career post acting out of trying to help people express scientific ideas better. And there's also a fun thing. I, I don't remember exactly what it's called. Seeing your PhD. What is it? Uh, you all have heard of it, haven't you? It's, it's where it's where uh, doctoral students have to sing their their thesis. They have, they have to sort of explain it uh, <laughs> really crisply in song. Um, It would help if I spelled properly, but uh, different. You know, there's also a three minute thesis, which is I think different. Two minute papers, three minute thesis. Five minute university. I uh, there's five minute universities which we've talked about, uh, which aren't necessarily storytelling, uh, but these are attempts to take something complex and get it explained really, uh, really crisply, crisply. Was that singing PhD? Did you say, Jerry? I'm trying to figure out what its actual name is. I don't know. I thought it was sing your PhD, but uh, let me just Google that. Uh, dance your PhD. <clears throat> That's it. 
Oh, much better. Yeah. Interpretive dance. Yeah. 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 Dance Your PhD started in 2008, has a Wikipedia page. Uh, good. I will paste that in the Zoom. The reason I liked seeing your PhD in terms of narrative is uh, some years ago when running an innovation camp in Finland, in Espo, the second largest city in Finland, uh, in his introduction to the camp and his setting a working assignment for all the people participating, the vice mayor, the deputy mayor of Espo sang it. And that's one of the things I'll never forget in my life. Uh, he's a small guy, uh, about my size, very thin, uh, singing about what he wanted all of our people here to know about. Uh, I don't do it nearly as well as he does, but I can, I can guarantee if you ever hear something like that, it's unforgettable. <laughs> So sometimes just the contrasting delivery makes a really big difference, right? Yeah. And, and it may even hinder the message. I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of nuance and a lot of whatever that was missed, but boy, you remember that that instance. Yeah. yeah. And, and a piece of this conversation, I think, I hope, is also the crazy ass narratives that seem to be traveling really, really well through society. Uh, the, the troubling narratives that people are willing to believe that demonize other uh, you know other groups or uh, create conflict uh, all kinds of things all kinds of things going on um, so there's all sorts of all sorts of bad stuff up hi Judy hi Bill good morning good morning Judy have you been in any science presentations where somebody did something different than the musing uh, I was I, I think I don't know if you were on the call yet but I, I mentioned dance your PhD. Uh, there's a couple other things like that of, of trying to spice up, spruce up, and change the mode of communication for complex stuff. Um, <laughs> no, I haven't. Um, but maybe it's just because Minnesota is sort of an upper Midwest, slightly conservative environment. <laughs> and most of the PhDs I've listened to were up here. <clears throat> and the other <laughs> ones were 40 years ago. So <laughs> that's a long time. <laughs> so they could have done like him, your PhD. That's true. That would have maybe suited better, but I guess that didn't get done either. No, I think the most that I've seen is is sort of uh, colorful photography, amusing photography related to the either the topic or the lab work or something as sort of a you know placeholder slide before the person stepped to the podium or that kind of thing. Yeah. Anybody else had experience of, of these kinds of things anywhere? The fact that we haven't sort of saddens me. I had a friend who was an opera singer um, and she frequently sang rather than talking because she said it was better for her vocal cords, which was very disconcerting to have her just singing the conversation. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> That's very interesting. Um, All I can think of is, oh, say, can you see the point of my PhD? <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> good job ken um uh, so narrative storytelling uh, anybody else take it take it wherever you'd like to uh favorite narratives uh failures of narrative uh anything ken i'm gonna put a, a very cynical uh excellent to into youtube um anybody knows steve cuts the animator steve cuts this is called rat race and uh it's just a brilliant takedown of, of uh, modern society. Um, so I think it's about four minutes. And it's, it's cynical and, and a little depressing, but really well done. You're, you're muted, Jerry. Somehow you shut yourself up. Good. I muted myself so that I wouldn't play the video for everybody. Um, thanks. I have a video of his called Man and I have him, but I don't have Rat Race. So watch that when we're... Do you want to describe it a little bit, or is that a plot spoiler? Um, no, it's just a. It depicts a bunch of rats as in human form, and what we chase after, and how we we chase after the dollar, and where that leads us, and it it just shows the destruction of society, and um, it's got a a nice little twist at the end. Um, 
But uh, yeah, four minutes worth um, worth a look if you want to have a cynical view of the world or reinforce your already existing cynical view of the world. Yeah, and you're reminding me of Mouse, Mouse One and Two, mm -hmm. by Art Art Spiegelman as storytelling masterpieces. Yeah, at least at least I think they were. They were incredibly memorable and. And part of his story is about how how his dad internalized a lot of things that happened to him uh, during the Holocaust. One of which is he, his dad takes will take a half box of cereal back to the store to try to get a refund for the uneaten cereal <laughs> uh, because there's something of value there and you don't throw anything away. And he hoards. He's got a giant ball of aluminum foil because he won't ever throw away a piece of aluminum foil, or I think it was aluminum foil. Uh, those kinds of those, those kinds of things but they were and he tells a story with rats mice and cat uh, cats uh and dogs i think i think the poles were dogs um and it's really compelling it just really works um so why are we not reaching for alternate modes of communication more often as a as a society not us on this call necessarily but but if this is powerful and memorable why is it also so rare? I have a, a in the failure of uh, storytelling or narrative or something like that. I, um, Jerry, you and I both, and probably most of the people here, I, you know, back in the Silicon Valley 20 years ago, 25 years ago, or something like that, I, it, it feels talking about storytelling or narrative as a powerful medium. Uh, feels to me like uh, salon discussions we used to have, you know, a quarter century ago. Um, and now, often, memes win and headlines win. I like, I, I know a bunch of people who know, who have everything they're going to think about a particular topic from a strongly worded headline and maybe a, you know, a, a quick image or a quick video or something like that. And so I feel like a reverence for storytelling. I obviously I I'm I have a lot of feelings for story and narrative and um, and yeah, it seems like something that that um, in our kind of twitchy neurophysiology, you know, um, hyper stimulated web experience, web and app experience anymore, you know. It, uh, um, a long thing to watch is a TikTok. Um, and, you know, I like, we don't do story anymore, really. I don't, I don't know that there's actually a contradiction there, at least not in my head, because the 60 second story is the lingua franca of our time. But if, unless there's a thread there somehow, people aren't as compelled. And a lot of the animation around it seems to be getting sort of automated or easier to do or easier to apply because everybody thinks that, you know, the TikTok thing was some, was certainly with a soundtrack, but then also some text floating across and some, some effects or whatever uh, is catchy and, and will, will feed the algorithm or something like that. But, but I think that, may, I think my, my interpretation of what you're saying is that really, really short stories are incredibly effective. I, the, I, I feel like it's something different. I feel okay. like most of the things that we, the, the short things, the 30 second, you know, a 20 second video, it's not a story. It's part of a story. It's an impression. It's a, an emotional reaction. It's it. And, and I'm bemoaning the fact that people don't present 60 second stories. They present, you know, 10 or 20 second, like flash impressions. And that's, good enough to hook people hook people's brains and their limbic systems and things like that that's interesting because maybe i'm different and differently lured by these short things because the, the youtube shorts that i'm attracted to are did you know that in apocalypse now martin sheen blah 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 and in, like in a minute i've learned a thing that happened on set you know during the filming of a movie and it's and it's some of these are really really well done i uh, i love them the guy, the the guy Luxury L U X X U R Y, who anal analyzes songs and tells you who copied whose song and who sued whom and who got the money for whatever. Oh my God, some of these things are mind blowing and, and stuff I never ever knew and couldn't have hunted down and I couldn't have shown you the parallel tracks because he's got, 
he's got the digital versions of the music and he's like, here, look, play, 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 same, same tune, uh, interpolated. And interpolation's okay, but copying and sampling without rights is not, who knows? Um, so so for me, they're, they're very stories, but you're right, many of them are not at all. They're just like, hey, here's my sandwich. The, the flip side of this is stories about the future seems like most of the stories we're hearing about the future are really grim and dark. And I love the the rise of solar punk, which says, you know, we're going to paint pictures of the future that we can live into that are that are hopeful, that are, you know, show humans thriving. And um, you know, the media seems to constantly latch on to stories of despair and grimness and murder and mayhem. And it's like, where are the stories that um, are circulating that actually give people a sense of purpose and hope and pride and and something worth living into and then always looking for stories like that and if so, only we knew somebody who convenes people to create stories about the future gosh hmm. i think hank is distracted right now or he would jump right in <laughs> uh yeah i i'm trying to type here in my own notes while I'm listening and thinking of something to say. Uh, echoing uh, Ken and what you just said, Jerry, I find myself always talking about we need new stories, we need better stories, we need positive stories. And that's one of the things I showed up today to try to hear what I mean by that. I mean, I'm not sure what I mean by that, but I was thinking if that type of conversation emerged here, it would help me understand. Uh, yeah, there are there are people in the, the world of uh, futurists who do convene people to tell good stories of the future, but uh, they do it within their own their own work frame and not necessarily uh, make them available to others. So um, let me take that question of of uh, of yours, uh, Ken, and yours, Jerry, to the World Futures Federation uh, uh, Studies Conference in ten days in Paris, and ask them, because I think that's a great question. Can you um, reach back into your time uh, at these convenings, and you know, you've you've convened uh, young people to do stuff and so forth. Are there a couple of memorable things that 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 stick out in your head of like, well, that happened and it was really pretty cool and unexpected, or something? Just like from from the realm of storytelling or or framing context for stories and all that. Yeah, I've got something to share. It's not in the realm of, of young people, which is still something I'm trying to work on. But many years ago, when I was working for uh, uh, government ministries, departments in, uh, in the Netherlands, we had uh, courses in how to tell your story so that your colleagues become interested in your work. And what we found when we had people telling them uh, sort of in an informal setting before or after lunch is that people who were doing almost the same thing, but not talking about it with their colleagues, got together and were able to uh, create the synthesis of uh, one plus one is uh, three or 11 uh, because uh, at least in those days in government circles, People tended to think, well, what I'm doing is so complicated, nobody could ever understand it. But when they were able to tell it as a story, uh, yeah, it turned out that not only did people understand it, but uh, people were doing the same thing, which resulted in much more effective work when they were trying to figure out how to include citizens in their uh, policymaking. Mm hmm Cool. When you started talking about new stories, I, I just went into my brain and looked up, shared, uh, look, looked up new stories. And that took me to the sentence, our old stories keep us from hearing the new stories. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. So I connected to that. And that reminded me of watching this TEDx talk, Take Back the Power of Your Story by Mary Alice Arthur from uh, TEDx Keele University. And uh, I will post the, the link in our chat. But um, 
it's a really it's a really lovely uh, thing about stories. And then I'm remembering now that there's another one, uh, the, the danger of of one story. I think it was called another TEDx talk that's all about storytelling and really really good. Uh, if I just say danger story, storytelling. Uh, it's, does anybody remember the name of it? Here, the danger of a sing, uh, Chimamanda uh, Adichie, the danger of a single story. That's it right here. So I'm going to link these two because they're connected, and I've got them all under articles about storytelling. But the single story robs people of dignity. The single story creates stereotypes. There's a different story about climate change. Starts with water is an article about this. Uh, a post called complicating the narratives. Oh, there we go. Um, let me copy this into the chat as well. I think this is by Amanda Ripley in Medium. Uh, and she has a, a bunch of really good advice here. But complicating questions uh, is a piece of it as well. So let me stop the share and uh, paste some of these links. Uh, Doug, please. As I'm listening to this, I get the feeling that a narrative is uh, uh, so powerful because it cracks open the present. Uh, like splitting an atom. As soon as you take a present moment and put, a nar put it into a narrative or pull a narrative into it, uh, amazing things happen. But I think we also have to um, be cognizant that narratives are being shaped to direct uh, opinion. So there's a great you know, purpose behind it. I mean, my neighbor is a retired lieutenant colonel who you know, was stationed uh, in Europe at NATO and was all working all over the world. And he just floored me a couple of days ago because his understanding of the Israeli, uh, of the Palestinian uh, uprising days, because we released $8 billion back to Iran and that funded this effort and made it possible. And I'm going, <laughs> I mean... You know, you should have uh, you know better strategic understanding you know, of of and, and not pick up a slogan like this. But that thing, th that meme has uh, spread far and wide to discredit you know instantly the Biden administration before anybody even thinks about forming a narrative. You have teams of people looking at every world event to see how they can translate that to fire up the base. You know? and, and then you have to you now think about how to push against that. And, and then they're already you know, totally rehearsed uh, how uh, to respond if somebody pushes back with facts and all of this stuff. So, so we don't really have an effort to create narratives that push people into a positive future. You know that that creates visions of what we could be doing, and people are really hungry for that. You know, I, I mean, when when you work, start working at community level, you know, and and you you know come together with you know, and, uh, the, the everyday you know folks who are engaged with nonprofit efforts and so on, they're hungry to hear you know the things about potentially. Uh, uh, we could do this and you know, here, here we can make our lives more secure and better, but there is no concert, no concentrated, there are no think tanks, you know, on on the uh, um, regenerative side, let's say, who are, who are targeting you know, messages that they can put out there that give people hope and, and, and direction. Um, Doug, is your hand up because you wanted to jump back in? Nope, that was purely my fault. No worries, um, Paul. I was I was attracted to what you, to your work because <clears throat> of a story you told on a VHS tape many many moons ago, um, of you working in the hillsides of central northern California, or uh, somewhere in that geography. And it was a quiet but compelling story because you you for me that that was like your narrative of how you were changing and healing your landscape. Um, and I think in your blog, you, you try to tell stories a bunch as well. And um, I'm wondering if you would maybe um, just riff on some of that, what it's meant for you. Uh, you're muted. First, I apologize for not being around for like half a year, but in the summertime, 
in the heat. I need to do my work outside early. It's a, um, anyway, it's cooler out there now. So I decided, hey, take a break and rejoin because I've always enjoyed reading the emails that get posted afterwards. Um, and so I know you're talking about stories today. Um, yeah, stories, I find people are, are pulled to my, are moved by my stories. And um, rather than talking about them, I'm going to just shift over to my current thing, one of my current things, which is I'm semi-retired from the school we started, kindergarten through eighth, but I still help out. And twice a year, we do camping trips. And around the campfire, I tell a story. And I kind of feel like it's uh, kind of our little version of Prairie Home Companion, and I get to tell a story from like Wobegon. Um, and, and they're really aimed at the kids trying to plant a spiritual seed in the kids because kindergarten through eighth grade. And uh, I find that deeply, deeply um, satisfying and um, and I love the way the parents also come up to me afterwards and talk about how that story meant a lot to them. So, um, yeah, so stories, they are a mystery. They're seeds that sprout in ways we, it's hard to, to know. And uh, I'm not sure where to go from there, but I'm happy to talk about stories. Thanks, Paul. Um, anyone else want to jump in? Pick up from where we are. Yeah, I'll, one of the places I ran into the old story of investing before this thing called impact investing was around was when I got into Bill Gates' office uh, and we were wanting to invest in a fair trade coffee company that it was been one of his direct reports. And so we got in and in 16 seconds, he said, stood up and said, ah, I can't be around this story, you know, or, or this, 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 I can't be around this concept it, and it act like it hurts and it, the back of his head hurt. And he said, I have two pockets. I want to put one, I want to put all the money in the world in and the other, I want a small pocket. I want to do some good with him. You see, there's a link you have to leave. And people, we got kicked out by two other, or, or we got our conversation stopped by two other billionaires, but they let us pay for breakfast. And so we created this other story, but they couldn't be around the concept, but they could be around the reality. So we made SoCap over, overly abundant. So it was, feels like it's drinking from a fire hose so that it uh, targeted the amygdala and people liked what they saw, but, they, but we avoided the prefrontal cortex where people knew they didn't like it before they saw it. It's also interesting that the same story can be framed in different settings with different characters. Uh, I mean, there are, you know, Nazar <clears throat> is is the character of a whole bunch of stories from Arab culture, <clears throat> Nazruddin, Nazreddin, um, and there's all kinds of stories that show up in other cultures and other places without Nazar It's just that there, there's a uh, an object lesson or something that somebody wants to tell. But if you were to tell it to somebody who doesn't like the frame, they would bounce, right? But the story might not be objectionable, just the frame. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, subvert, subvert the, the prefrontal cortex is the way you can get to easier change. Yeah, yeah. Well, I can jump in and tell one other story if I can just do this quickly. <clears throat> we we uh, started a, a publication for uh, farm-raised catfish back in the late 80s, early 90s, and it, it took off in Mississippi because there were some ponds that wouldn't drain. And then the farmers uh, got 87 cents on the retail dollar compared to three cents on cotton and seven cents on uh, soybeans, or no, seven cents cotton, anyway. Um, but everybody knew catfish in the old way where it's a scum sucking bottom dweller. You know, it automatically gets, they get an internship at McKinsey. <clears throat> but if you feed them a nutritious grain and aeration, they are a filter feeder. And so you could re so replace them with Dover Soul. And so what we did was we hired Willard Scott 
to do go to all the small NBC TV stations up the Mississippi basin <clears throat> and go into Salina, Kansas with, uh, you know, the morning woman and the morning guy and, you know, the Shishi um, Salina restaurant and where we worked with him on a recipe. He says, you know, catfish is a white tablecloth thing. And the, 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 the technology changed the fish because it's a filter feeder. And McKinsey was disappointed, obviously. But the, uh, and, and it grew into a $3 million industry because in all those small places, people they trust said the story is different with a restaurant that most people in that town wanted to go to. And Willard was the reason we got on the air. That's awesome. And, and so many stories of influencers being influenced and people reaching out to celebrities. I mean, uh, a big hunk of the uh, Sam Bankman Freed uh, uh, FTX story is all the celebrities who jumped in and said, oh, yeah, you got to put all your Bitcoin over here uh, in FTX, uh, who now mostly regret it. Uh, but but the power of, of getting somebody well known drops you into the media, which is kind of our storytelling mechanism, right? Uh, other than things that travel word of mouth or word of mouth uh, media is, is what we do. Yeah. Well, you know, you used to be able to buy a celebrity and now they create their own on TikTok. It's, there's a real power shift. Uh, these influencers have their own thing. It's, it's really different. You know, I used to see them as a commodity and just figure out which, which one of the commodity you wanted. You know, right. the, drop in Paul Hawken. Okay, good. So, Jerry, you mentioned Nasruddin. This book was given to me for Christmas 1973. Mm. Uh, Subtleties of the Inimitable Mullah Nasruddin. And I'll just read a very short story from this. It's called Two Halves. Nasruddin opened a lecture agency. He knew so many people who felt that they had something interesting to say. Why not become their agent? The ones that felt they were interesting, however, were usually not interesting people. He got many complaints. Next time I shall make sure, he said. One day, a telegram arrived from a study society. Please supply a wit to address our group on Sunday. This time, I can make sure, said the mullet. He sent two of his lecturers and replaced and replied by a telegram, wits are difficult to find, so have sent two half-wits instead. Moral, the sum of the parts is not necessarily equal to the whole. <laughs> Love that. That's why he's the incomparable Mullah Nasruddin. <laughs> exactly. <clears throat> I, have a, I have another Nasruddin story to share, too. Please. It's the one I, I tell kids, because kids get it, or else they go, what? But uh, Nasruddin is eating lunch next to a river, and as he's eating, he sees this traveler approaching from the other side, coming toward the river. When the traveler reaches the river, he yells, how do I get across? And Nasruddin says, you are across. <laughs> that's a location joke right frame of reference joke yeah <clears throat> isn't, it, uh, isn't it Mullah Nasruddin who told the story of uh, a rich man who slipped off, slipped off the bank of the river and he was drowning in the river and someone came along the side and he said, uh, give me your hand. And the rich man went down for a second time. And the man who wanted to help called out, give me your hand. And the rich man went down for a third time. And then the person trying to help said, take my hand. And his hand was taken and the eye was pulled out of the water. Love that. So let's dwell a moment on underhanded stories and on disinformation that is packaged up in ways that sounds wacky. So, sometimes the nuttier the story, the better it travels. The more improbable the story, the more people will jump in and believe it. And that's something that it takes a real skill to figure out what shape a story needs to have to be wacky enough that credulous people will jump in, but not so wacky that nobody will buy it at all.
like QAnon? Uh, yeah, exactly. Exactly. And QAnon is sort of a collection of stories like that woven woven out of controversial subjects, you know, in, in different places. So, so you see that there's a bunch of mothers concerned about vaccines and autism. And Jenny McCarthy goes and, and like talks about it and becomes, a, you know, screws up her reputation, but brings a lot of attention to it. And then you see a couple other other stories that are sort of swirling around in the world and you paste them together into a larger narrative of corruption, deception, and underhandedness, and, e and, and, and evil coursing through the world, and then sell that. And sell the whole thing as, a, as a, uh, an ARG, an alternate reality game. Uh, there's a really nice essay by uh, uh, Adrian Hahn, uh, where he says, QAnon is an ARG. And he's right. Uh, there's there's like a key master who drops clues. There's a community that runs around like chasing down the clues and doing stuff. It's and 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 when you think of QAnon as an ARG and the storytelling woven into something like that, it shifts how you might try to tackle it and what you might do about it. And I, I have not seen anybody do something productive with his insight. I have not seen a countermeasure. I've not heard a story told of a countermeasure to QAnon that was developed because they understood it differently, which is too bad. Um, Kevin, go ahead. Um, and just that uh, QAnon was not a viral phenomenon. It really comports to Damon Centola's complex contagion. It had Q, but really it had little groups. And if you do research on it, I did a bunch of this and it was small groups of little Facebook groups in a, a subdivision or whatever. And so three or four people that you know and trusted is how you heard the story. And so it was, and that's what's happened with the complex contagion. They don't buy the story. They buy it within a, a nest of small relationships. And, uh, and but, but it makes the reality harder to break up. And that's why like, our closest volunteer fire department, fewer than half of them got the vaccine because they were building the story internally in a little, in, a, in small groups. And so, you know, when people think storytelling is a viral phenomenon to cause change, it's really not. It's groups of small folks, small groups who trust each other, who do it in cells and then gather. That's what I, I think Centola was right in, in trying to, do broad scale viral uh, behavior change is failed in, 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 in its inner culture that no longer exists. So this is the book Change How uh, the Power in the Periphery Makes Big Things Happen? Yeah, and he's got a center at Penn State and, and he does consulting and stuff, but it's but it's really just the that it's a complex contagion. You get it from multiple associates, you know, you don't you don't just get it like a virus you get it you have to be around three or four people or whatever who who are in it uh and they create the reality around you it works in a world where broad reality is broken so these and, are things that jay golden would call retellable stories yeah but it's not that they're retellable it's how you receive them that it's a complex contagion that the, the <clears throat> The, the the fact that it's complex is more important than the essence of the story. It's the, it's the social structure that I think Centola is really right about. Um, so I think you mean the shape of the communication topology or the shape of the communication. Yeah, topology? right. Exactly. Yeah, it, that it's complex and in small groups, and they create their own reality there, and they don't have have to have a reference to a broader reality. Um, I just want to explore what, what that means. Like the, the broader reality is the shared story of QAnon and the example we're going through. So there is kind of a shared <clears throat> broad reality. It might be that the details of the story got told very differently as it propagated like the game. No, th that you don't have to. There is no shared social reality that they participate in. This is a post-truth phenomenon that works in small clusters. Uh, I'm trying to just un understand what you mean by shared social reality, because I, th I think a piece of what we're talking about is that this didn't show up on CBS or ABC. There's no broadcast. There's no central broadcaster that's basically saying, here's the story and we all adhere to it, like Sesame Street <clears throat> or something like that. Stacey, please. So Kevin's right. So it was happening, happening in these small Facebook groups. 
is that they would connect on one point of part of the Q phenomena. The people didn't really know each other well enough to know this person's a crackpot. If they would have spoken more about different things, they would have realized, oh wait, this is not a trusted source. So he he's right. It's it's um, I mean, it's happening right now in another group um around the Israeli crisis where I had this very long drawn out conversation with somebody that most people wanted to throw out of the group and I was like let her have her opinion let her speak because it's important for other people who normally would agree with a lot of what she says because it might make sense in other things that she was saying um to what Klaus was saying I just want to add since I'm speaking I carry a meme on my phone, which is which addresses the misinformation about the millions of dollars in Iran. And I think what's called for now is, you know, we're talking about storytelling, which is one person telling a story. But I think when it comes to like the masses, we have to find a way to ask the questions that allow people to put their pieces of the story and to figure out how we weave that together. So again, I'm dealing with not as educated people. So when the whole thing with the Iran money comes out, I just, after you know showing them the correct information, I just ask sort of an open-ended question that might relate to Russia having an interest in this, just to get them to start thinking and kind of like, not to give them an answer, not to say, oh no, it's this, but to just throw out different possibilities because there are so many. And these are, there are a lot of people that, I mean, we're all curious beings. So some of us are more educated, some of us are less educated, some of us are not that smart or good critical thinkers, but we all have this desire to think that we know. And I, I just think that maybe better questions with a little bit more room to breathe and then trying to create stories is what's called for. Love that. Thank you. Um, Klaus. Yeah, the, the, uh, there is an interesting dynamic right now where the Republican uh, House has suggested all these drastic cuts uh, to uh, to a wide, wide variety of budgets, um, and one of those cuts would impact uh, SNAP benefits, school meals, and you know, a range of nutritional assistance programs, and so on. And the general public, by and large, hasn't dialed in with this; they're just not really aware with it. So. In the meetings that I've had now in Bend, because I'm now really trying to get dig into you know, community connections, I explained this linkage. You know, and when you think about the emotional impact of school meals, you know, when you talk with mothers who uh, finally, after years of fighting you know, to put a program together that they are pleased with and local sourcing and fresh food, find out that this money to support this is supposed to be cut by uh, uh, by their Republican representative, that really rings. You know, now you have to structure these stories really succinct, really short, you know, really easy to understand. But um, the our Republican uh, representative here in Bend is a member of the House Agricultural Committee, and they're already backpedaling because uh, no, she already got enough feedback that uh, this is a this is a hot iron to touch, and and so the to 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 help people understand the reality of what's being done in the political process and how this will impact their lives uh, in real um, down to earth you know bread and butter kind of uh, examples. Uh, that's that's also you know an an important part. Um, and it takes just a lot of patience, you know, but the moment you find touch points, which, you know, uh, uh, me working inside the, me, we did this focus group uh, kind of exercise here, and then you find where the community is really sensitive and where, you know, they, you know, they, they have passionate opinions about, and then you link that, you know, in a way that the system becomes transparent. 
and and how how these things fit together and work. Uh, I mean, it's an insane time when you when you have a, a Republican Party that talks people into voting for things that are against their own health care, their own, you know, their food and I mean their basic sustenance uh, and 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 have them go along with that. Uh, so to break that, um, it just requires some real patient, loving insertions uh, in story. You know, and it has to be story. You can't come up with a PowerPoint here. Thanks, Thomas. Um so many complex angles to this. I, 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 as as I, each of you is talking, I, my mind is going in lots of different directions and and um, sort of struggling with the nexus of of, of things here. Um, other thoughts on narrative story, uh, wish lists. What do you what do you wish would happen around story narrative? I wish the media, by which I mean all the corporate owned and controlled media, would recognize that the that a far more effective way of being in the world would be to show people how alike we are, how much we have in common, and how imperiled we all are. Because I think they're doing such a, a terrific job of dividing us. And if they if the media chose to shift their frame and say, you know what, we're all we got. We need to to work, work together. It would radically change everything. I know that's a really big wish, but that's my wish in terms of uh, using the storytelling <laughs> capabilities of media, which are incredible, um, and they're currently you know locked up and being abused by by corporate powers who are using them to just enrich themselves rather than to uh, share the wealth of humanity. I wish we had narrative that would work like QAnon, <clears throat> that would work in fractal groups who create their own local truth. Because uh, <clears throat> other, we, we still have a metaphor, and I still fall back on it, that to, of a broadcast reality. But general reality is broken down and people cr are creating their own. So we need narratives that work as modular fractal, and it happened in small groups. I don't know, you know, I mean, the, the effort to do rights of nature as a, a, a counterpart to corporate rights uh, is one of those that's happening in 20 cities. I mean, you know, maybe looking at places where there's lots of rights like that that are similar, that are bubbling up would be something. And looking at the recent uh, bio or, or story about Thurgood Marshall in the New Yorker and how he used the same tactic, you know, he, he did 11 small suits that moved civil rights forward before he did big moves. The same with Ruth Bader Ginsburg and what's her name, Palmer with LGBT rights. So small narratives that move things forward in local places. But that's what I always say. Oh, um, I love that approach. Um, I'd love to keep exploring that. Pete, then Doug. Um, I love it too. That's that's really smart, Kevin. I think, and and it makes me think that I, I or I wonder how much um, uh, QAnon is actually uh, just a lucky evolutionary success rather than uh, an, an engineered set of stories. Um, so so then there's kind of a meta question: uh, How can you you know maybe how could you deploy a, a set of stories in which you expect some of them to be evolutionary winners? Um, Rather than trying to get one story that fits well into a bunch of fractal fractal pieces. Uh, Doug, you're muted. I'm getting a feeling that uh, just listening that narratives are really dangerous things. Uh, maybe the only thing that's more na dangerous is no narratives. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, the f in framing this call, I think that the disinformation side of this is at least as important as the as the how do we tell nice stories that are object lessons that help us educate other people or whatever. Uh, Paul. I like what the said about Thurgood Marshall and that makes me think that maybe one of the powers of starting with small 
local stories is it develop it establishes your integrity that if you try going right to the big audience you probably have some ulterior motive for trying to do that and you're judged superficially quickly whereas if you're working on these small things and the people around you go this person has integrity this person's worth supporting worth uh, telling others about i think maybe that's where the power comes from thanks um hank I'm really uh, beginning to like this part of the conversation today and uh, the way Stacy and Klaus and Kevin, you put your statements out there are helping me to understand my own question better. Uh, that question, I said it earlier in the, in the conversation. I'm always saying we need new stories. We need different stories. We need better stories. And that's become a bit clearer. But I have a question again for the group. Who has to tell these stories? And how are they made widely known? Um, are they told on television or in pop songs or in comic books? And uh, well, let, let me leave it at that. Who has to tell the stories and how to make them widely known? Uh, Kevin or someone else, if you want to take a swing at that. Well, I, I find <laughs> that, uh, I'm sorry, did I jump? No, go ahead, Paul. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I, I find that uh, stories uh, work like a virus. Uh, so so it's a meme. Um, and if it's well designed, it starts <clears> traveling. <throat> uh, so, so it doesn't almost doesn't almost doesn't matter where you insert it it takes on a life of its own but there are certain insertion points that are more effective you know and and uh and you you look for um for groups that are that are in that same frame of mind but when you um make particularly important is to make connections you know to to bring in a systems perspective so people understand how stuff is connected and linked. And um, I mean, I wish there was a, a, a serious think tank kind uh, of energy out there that that uh, does the same what the Heritage Foundation does, you know, and all these five or six think tanks that are funded by mostly the fossil fuel industry, uh, but also by the food industry. Uh, because they're now starting to realize that uh, you know there's some serious uh, challenge ahead uh, for them, and so they're fighting it. And the and so they have targeted uh, efforts, you know, to put out these memes that disrupt people's attention. It's like this thing about the eight billion dollars for Iran, right? I mean, all of a sudden changes the entire conversation and the mindset, and it's. It, it stumbles you know, the efforts of the administration to have a coherent uh, position for us to take. So the, 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 uh, uh, it's not complicated where to insert it. You know, if you have an idea that sparks and, 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 and that, that uh, seems to make sense, I mean, for example, the, the connection that um, trying out the soil with chemicals is disrupting the hydrologic cycles, right? Well, everybody knew that chemicals are trying out the soil. Uh, uh, desertification is a, was a common term, but for some reason, we missed completely that the climate models didn't incorporate the hydrologic cycle and the impact of, of water uh, uh, on, on accelerating uh, the perceived climate change. Now, and so once you put that out, you have this aha because you're dealing with factoids that are fully understood and known by everybody. It just hasn't been stitched into a story. Now, so so this that's what I mean by acting like a virus. The moment you combine uh, known pieces of information into a conclusion or what is what this means, and it's just like super simple to get, so to speak, 
that stuff starts traveling <clears throat> really fast. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'd like to suggest the exact opposite. It's it is a it's a many to many distribution method within a small group. That's the nature of a complex contagion. If I get next to you with COVID, I can get it. With the complex contagions, you have to get to three or four people that you listen to, and then you warp your reality. So I think we need stories that warp within local realities that would work in you know the small group of the volunteer firemen or the if you look at, at uh, QAnon, they were also in uh, email groups that did pick up of kids after school or you know uh, the moms of a, a, a swim class. You know the comp it's it's completely you know it is a contagion, but it's a many to many. You have to touch be touched many times, and your immunity to truth uh, goes down because that group then becomes your reality. And the, the the story nexus, it needs to be more like a collage of evolvable stories to sort of riff on what Pete was saying a little earlier, I think. It, it's a, Yeah, something. You know, QAnon yeah. did it really well, you know. Yeah, ad admirably so, unfortunately. Uh, Doug B? Yeah, I just, I was triggered by Hank, uh, Hank's question. Um so the question, you know, who's who's to tell stories? I think um, anyone that can help. And um, so, uh, I taught for several years. I taught a personal growth development workshop in Israel, and a group of instructors, American instructors, because they were the only ones certified for a decade and a half. And some Israeli instructors were trained. And um, a group of American instructors that taught over there have, have offered to convene a session with graduates. Um, it's a rather large and vibrant community um, on Saturday as a in service to. And so I've been living this question um, in a very immediate and demanding way um, for the last week odd since this was sparked. And um, to Kevin's point, the, the nature of the workshop itself and the glue of the community that's going to be there is individual self-empowerment. And so people at the end of this usually um, feel like they've been given a bunch of tools and been super empowered out the back end uh, in the way they relate to the world and what they can do in the world. And What's come up for me is, um, in terms of what's needed, is there a story, is there a narrative that I can offer to catalyze in them a, a vastly accelerated way of healing and transcending and escaping the overwhelming grief and trauma that they're trapped in, in service to being in service to their world, their community, because they're uniquely equipped. And um, I share this because uh, um, would be very open and interested in any thoughts that anybody has. I, unfortunately, I literally have to go right now, but um, most of you know where to find me, but any thoughts or any things that arise for you in that context, threading this needle of respecting, honoring, acknowledging 
their feelings, acknowledging the trauma, acknowledging where they're at, um, and catalyzing offerings for them to rise above and um, gain some space and peace and, and um, peace um, without triggering anything, without poking any buttons or adding any trauma. Um, or whether it's simply just listening. So um, I uh, solicit all of you <laughs> uh, for anything that you might want to send or offer um, uh, to help me figure this out. Thank you, Doug. Thank you for, for telling us about it. Uh, can you can you put a link to the or just mention the group so that we can kind of Yeah, it's it's um I'll put it in the chat. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, anyone with ideas, contact Doug. Um, and Ken, if you want to enter the conversation at your pace, at your own pace. Thank you, Doug. Kind of building on what Doug just said, um, whose stories get told? You know, we have dominant narratives and then we have narratives that rarely get heard. And you all know I have a deep love of poetry and there's a wonderful um, woman whose name is Carol Ann Duffy, who's an incredible poet. Um, and she's written a book called The World's Wife. And it is a lovely book filled with um, uh, the misses of major characters throughout history. And I'll read you a really short one. It's called Mrs. Darwin. 7 April 1852, went to the zoo. I said to him, something about that chimpanzee over there reminds me of you. Um, which I find hilarious. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then on a more serious note, um, Bayo Okomolafe, uh, Bayo Okomolafe, uh, I was listening to a talk of his and I, I extracted some notes and he says, you know, colonization might involve the stealing of people's wealth, but that's not the central idea. Colonization is about reinventing the frames of reference of a people so that the way they make sense of things changes. Colonization will say, the relationship you have with that mountain no longer makes sense. That mountain is a thing to you now. So blow it up and build a highway there. Colonization is about the loss of meaning, the loss of story, and the loss of agency. And I think this is a really important thing to, to ponder of how are our stories either empowering humanity to move forward or destroying our ability to exist? Because some of the, the major narratives, as Doug pointed out earlier, um, are very dangerous. You know, the narrative of, of um, manifest destiny, historical narrative, incredible destructive power. Uh, and yet people bought into it. The narrative uh, that the Jews are the problem has led to amazing suffering. And it still goes on. We're, we're witnessing it right now, the rise of anti-Semitism around the world. You know, Jews make up a quarter of 1% of the population and they're blamed for all of society's ills. Why is that? That's a very, very tough story to go up against and figure out why does that have so much traction? Uh, does hum do humans really need a scapegoat and, and does it have to be, can't we have a scapegoat of, of, you know, a larger population like the Catholic church would work for me. <laughs> I could scapegoat them for a ton of stuff, you know? Um, so the flip side of story of, of whose stories get dominated, become dominant is what are the stories that are lost when we have dominant narratives that are so um, uh, seductive and powerful and, and destructive? I'll put um, this quote from Bayo in the chat. Thank you, Ken. I'm reminded of um, caste and how uh, colonizers invent castes in order to create subgroups that can be pitted against each other so that they can be one up and one down. And uh, there's a diagram on the Wikipedia page I just uh, shared. There's a diagram of sort of the castes in Latin America and uh, there, there's other 
other you know cultures that did similar sorts of things. Tutsi and Hutu were invented by colonizers in order to separate people in Rwanda and Uganda and places like that. Uh, these were all mo modes of control, and is Isabel Wilkerson's book about it exactly. Um, but these were these were all overlay stories, and and I posted a little bit earlier in the chat uh, George Monbiot's a really, really good TEDx talk about uh, the stories that that need to be replaced or, or brought in. And he he talks about how Keynes's story got replaced by the neoliberal story, which now needs to be replaced by something else. And he gives really nice synopses of each of these. And one of the things that he does is uh, he creates a trope uh, that about all the stories start with like, uh, the, the earth is in danger or something like that. I'm, I'll go look it up. But he does a very nice job of turning these all actually into, into stories or tropes that get repeated and become part of the air we breathe and part of the assumptions we make about how to act in the world. And, and there are conservative tropes and there are liberal tropes and they are in combat in the, in the field every day. Um, Kevin, then Paul. I'm um, in a gathering uh, in uh, Albuquerque next well, later tomorrow, actually, about them, about digital twins. And it's a they're making a big deal about it. And that's like you can look down below and you can see how the planners can do infrastructure, data, transportation, plumbing, et cetera, to design the future. And as I look at all their schemas, it, it has nothing about the fact that in one zip code in Albuquerque, you die 10 years younger than you do in other zip codes, social determinants of health. That's the, the major way to look at it. And it's also linked to redlining. And so I'm, what I'm gonna ask him is, you know, how do you design the future acknowledging the historic injustice that you're gonna you know, replicate if you don't work to, uh, to get over that? And you know, as with many wonderful tech futurists, they haven't thought about the folks who aren't like themselves or the folks who, who you know, the fact that there is structural injustice, that their data, it, 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 structural injustice, you know, poor neighborhoods subsidize rich neighborhoods in every city and county. Uh, and, and you can go into why that is, but you know, the, the poor neighborhood is overtaxed, the rich neighborhood is undertaxed. And it, it, is a, it is a total reality. And it you know, goes back to the fact that black folks weren't given FHA mortgages, or, and they weren't given GI loans. But the other part of it is that uh, it, it's happening and uh, the digital twins have not looked into history when they're looking into rerouting the physical and digital infrastructure. So I'm really curious to see how receptive they are about that, uh, looking at this other data set. Thanks, Kevin. And just to clarify on the digital twins thing, is this a is this a gap in the data that meant then that the digital twins didn't actually reflect the harsher harsher realities on the ground? Like how, how I, I'm I'm trying to bridge between what what little I know about digital twins and the situation you just described. They the, Unjust economic architecture is not something they looked at. They looked at how plumbing worked, how data worked, how transportation worked, how construction worked. And they didn't look at, you know, uh, where do bus routes not go, you know, or what neighborhoods are too far from a clinic. And, but then, you know, just, you can start with the real simple thing of what neighborhoods are people dying 10 years younger in. That's mm -hmm. the data set that, that kind of analysis doesn't occur, occur to tech futurists because they drive past those neighborhoods. Thank you. And just before Paul goes, I want to say something very quickly about what Kevin just said. Um, many years ago, I was at a, uh, a meeting in the Minds conference, and um, they always award people for things. And, and there was a company here in the Bay Area that was given an award for creating um, uh, sensors you can put on your car and as you drive around uh, it samples the air and then it sends it to a central location and it analyzes the air quality and it turns out that um, due to prevailing winds a lot of of um, neighborhoods that are in quote good neighborhoods have really poor air quality because we've got you know several uh, refineries around here that pollute so um, to amplify what kevin said there, there's zip codes where that shows up but there's also um, 
it's showing up as, you know, air doesn't reach, air moves. And so if you pump chemicals into the air and same thing with water, you don't know where they're going to end up. And um, all that nice neighborhood that you're, this this big Tony neighborhood with these big houses and nice lawns are often ending up um, being much more polluted than people thought, but it's not known because the sensors aren't there. And now that this sense, these sensor networks are getting out there, that's kind of recasting how people think about um, pollution. Sorry, go ahead, Paul. I'm pretty sorry, thank you, Paul. Um, I hate to disrupt the conversation, but I just wanted to jump back 15 minutes ago to something Klaus said. Um, he's talking about the water cycle in terms of climate change and talking about stories. I think that is a story that is spreading right now. So in terms of our interest in stories, I think that's one just to watch because I think it's it's a good viral thing that is happening right now. And it's it seems like it's spreading really fast in the last year. So it's just something for us to be watching. Thanks, Paul. Uh, I'm struck that a lot of stories that move far and fast through small groups, large groups, whatever, are bizarre stories. They're strange stories. They're funny stories. They have They have some kind of a crazy twist. And a big piece of what we've been talking about here is the telling the story of how things work in the world, of science, of facts. And those things are, I, I'm afraid, more boring. Now, there's a lot of people who try to make science really exciting by showing you what, you know, up close in the microscope, what that thing really looks like. And it's like, ooh, gross, or whatever. But but do, do important facts need to be dressed up in crazier clothes so that they'll carry better? Or is that a terrible idea? Like, like the story of the water cycle can be told many different ways. It's a, it's a, it's a narrative of facts and how water works in the world. Um, it, it, would, it, would it communicate better? Would it be more contagious if it were packaged differently or told differently? Or, uh, I, I'm, Rhetorical question, maybe. Um, can I just answer? I can I just say something real quick on that? Yeah. Because when when Klaus was saying it was started earlier, and he said everybody's always known. I wanted to say no. Everybody hasn't always known, and that's part of the problem because you have a large amount of the population that are questioning everything, don't know anything, don't know who to believe. I actually think starting at the basics where there won't be an argument is the best place to start. And what what and what the basics are, it would be a very interesting conversation. Like small. I mean yeah. very small <laughs> basics. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Um Klaus then Pete. Yeah, I actually uh have an opportunity this afternoon the climate reality project, you know, the Al Gore initiative there, they asked me to explain this story of uh, the water cycles uh, to the uh, to a chapter meeting so they have like 96 chapter leaders in the call and uh, um, and I decided to make a story out of it to not have a PowerPoint presentation but to just use my own words apologize up front you know but hey I'm not a scientist you know but here is how I understand this works. Uh, and just level, you know, with people who are basically at my wavelength. I mean, they're all professionals, actually, and uh, from from all walks of life. And uh, so how do you process what this is and how this works? So that's really, uh, uh, I, I think that's a nice opportunity to, to escalate this because Al Gore has not been really incorporating land use principles into his speeches. He's doing wonderful you know, work in many ways, but he hasn't he hasn't corked that yet, you know, what uh, uh, and and how to how to frame it. So the, so that's still that's still uh, struggling. But the the I posted something from Yuval Harari there, uh, who is basically saying that you have to look at narrative and stories like it is software, right? Because it drives uh, our it, it it what we believe drives what we how we interpret reality and how we respond to external stimuli. So if we treat it like software, right, then it takes on a different way of, of shaping it. And unfortunately, you know, all these, these um, fairly recent recognitions like Yuval Harari and others, um, 
have been picked up by all the wrong people, right? Um, you know, you you have uh, you know the most sophisticated communications technology uh, being misused and and uh, being used to manipulate you know, outcomes, and so that's uh, uh, and, and there is no there is no thoughtful counter to that, right? So you really want to get into um, how do you stem against this, and then that becomes. I mean, it's like dealing with with a, with viral intrusions in your software. You know, how do you detect the virus? How do you neutralize it? And, I mean, it's just think in these terms, you know. And then that that shaping of stories takes on a whole different context. Thanks, Klaus. Um, Pete. Uh, thanks. Um, thanks, Klaus. I, I like that. And Stacy, I like what you said too about starting with with uh, things that aren't contentious um, and moving on from there. I, I also like what you said before, something that uh, something about people, everybody being many people being very curious about things and and when you give them things that, when, when somehow they find something that satisfies that curiosity or works towards that curiosity, maybe it's a good thing, maybe it's a bad thing. Um, but, but mostly I, I wanted to connect kind of that to uh, what Jerry said. Jerry, you had a, an interesting thing. It's like stories about how the world works and science and facts, those seem boring. Um, and, you know, do we need to spruce it up and dress it up? I, I have a different model for that, I think, which is there are there are certainly people in the world who want to know how the world works and have tolerance or um, the mindset or um, the the background to be interested, curious about how things work and wanting to um, wanting to add to their scientific cosmology, actually, if you will. Um, the scientific cosmology is obviously a useful and practical and, and, you know, I don't know if I can actually say good or great or something like that, because the scientific cosmology is, is now it's apparent that it's a sibling of the capitalist um, ex extractive cosmologies, which are clearly really bad. So, um, but, but anyway, I, my model for the world of humans is that most people do not ha uh, belong to the scientific cosmology. They go along with it, um, but the cosmology that they own, that they live in, is the one that they grew up when, with or the one that they reacted to because they grew up with a different one. Um, and it's, it's built around a lot more of things that I think the scientific cosmology people think are old school or, or primitive or something like that, you know, and, and I don't even know how to name those cosmologies because they're not mine, but, you know, something more about animism or something more about humanism or something more about, you know, and, and in their worlds, telling them that, hey, do you, do you know the facts? Um, I can give you facts. Um, and it's like, why would I want that? I get everything I need from the people around me who tell me the way the world works. And your way of telling me the way the world works is bullshit. I've seen people like talk up and down and like, you know, try to confuse me and it just doesn't make any sense. I listen to the people I listen to and I'm very fine. Thank you very much. So I think, I, I think there's value in enhancing the narrative qualities of stories that you can present to people. But I think another big, big, big part of it, probably much bigger, is uh, understanding your audience and who you're trying to talk to and whether or not they even share the same cosmology as you. And if you don't do that, you're talking to a brick wall, basically, and or or you're sounding like an ass uh, talking to, to somebody who they feel knows a lot better than you. You know, I know how to live just fine without your science. Thank you very much. So thanks. Awesome, Pete. We have a we have a, a piece of a working experiment of that right now with Klaus's uh, book in progress, where he's applying spiral dynamics to uh, the water cycle and healthy soil 
and asking ChatGPT to take the spiral dynamics model and play out how would you communicate this set of, of stories or facts to people at different levels in the spiral dynamics model. And those people have different cosmologies. They have different worldviews, different needs, meshes, whatever it might be. But I think that, that, that you know, it, He's very much, very much sort of experimenting with what you were just describing uh, in that way for for pragmatic reasons of how do we tell this story to enough people that they'll make a change that they'll pick up and react. Um, and anybody who wants to join those conversations, we're talking on Mondays at ten thirty Pacific uh, in the same Zoom here. Hank, then Kevin. Thanks, Pete. Uh, I totally agree with you and Jerry for your uh, uh, extending that further. And I want to extend it further, but from another perspective, I've been re-watching a four-part uh, PBS television show uh, about hip hop. It's called Fight the Power, How Hip Hop Changed the World. Uh, I myself never really liked hip hop, never really listened to it, but that television series has opened my eyes and my mind to the power that uh, pop culture and and telling a story directly through a song can really influence people. And if I understood, if I understand the meaning that uh, uh, is coming out of this series, it's that so many people in the world had that story but never heard it expressed and weren't themselves ready to express it. And then when a couple of artists, uh, singers, uh, rappers came along and expressed it, there was a whole, uh, a whole house, a whole uh, country of people around the world who said, yes, that's what I believe. Thank you for uh, putting it out like that. And I'll just ask one other open question since we're getting near the end of it. Maybe, Ken, you might be someone who wants to pick it up. Uh, a rap song is a song. Uh, some songs are, so, are, are sent out to one target group and some are sent out to a whole part of the population. But how does poetry fit into that? How can poetry become the song that opens the world to people. Thank you. Um, Kevin, Judy. I know I've talked a lot, but I'll try to make this short. <clears throat> um, we have a conference that gathers the people who are, want to repair local economies. And our core group are the folks who have been disinvested and who die 10 years uh, younger. And we've got new economic things that deliver economic power to them. But we're finding some single issue partnerships that let us link to the new urbanists who think of themselves as the children of Jane Jacobs and they want to do walkable neighborhoods. And they discovered that taxation is unfair and has been historically unfair. And then they say, oh, and the people in those neighborhoods don't look like us. Oh, well, that's unfortunate, but they want to make taxation fair. And then we're reaching out to the folks that used to be the Bali Network, if you guys remember that, and they want to invest in their local economies. But these are the folks in the neighborhoods with trees and sidewalks who want to invest locally. And so we're creating a platform where you can invest locally in disinvested neighborhoods and the affluent neighborhoods, and they, they don't we don't ask the you know the the liberal white folks to to make economic justice be their thing, you know, which is I did for a couple of years, and it's just it's like shut the fuck up, you know, we're environmentalists, go away, <clears throat> um, and and we're just saying you know what are the thing you like that we can also be a place to gather, uh, and so we're gathering the folks who who are there's lots of local funds where you can invest, average people can invest in local small businesses. And we're gathering them because they have no place to really gather. Um, and there's several platforms. You know, there's Mainvest, Honeycomb, and a new version of WeFunder. And it's, you know, I, I go to Klaus Barbasi's link as the key thing where he said that right to life only asked single issue partnerships of their folks, but freedom of choice ask a litmus test and so one punches way above their weight because the leftist you have to be pure on multiple levels. 
whereas the, the we're borrowing from the the right saying we'll just agree on this and we you won't have to come in our door so that's a way to, to build a broader coalition and and you know you have to get over leftist thinking you know that wants everybody to agree on all the issues you care about so we're trying that might work I think a useful thing would be some exercise or process that helps people in particular here, which you just said, left leftists or progressives, see what they're blind to. Uh, basically, yeah, good luck. Uh, well, I, I think that if that worked, if we could find one that worked, it might cure a lot of things. Um, yeah, Judy. And then we're getting close to the end of our call time. You're muted. You're muted, yeah. Apologies. It's because I get background phone calls that are very distracting. <laughs> um, the question that comes to me, I guess, or the thought is that we're sort of sitting on the knife's edge of knowledge in terms of what we think we know, which may be incomplete or limited in scope, but it's our best understanding and the knowledge of a different group, which is built from a different framework that's very unlike ours. And it sort of goes back to that simple truth of seek first to understand, because unless you can come in at the perimeter of a known thought process, it's very hard to articulate a thought that's oppositional and have it heard in any way at all. And so there's a dynamic to this that is not so much about the content as it is about the communication process. And we've touched on that several times today, but I think that would be perhaps another rich area for deeper discussion or for sharing of resources because I've had to learn over my many years of interacting that the best thing I can do is keep quiet for a long time in a group of people and try to sense where the group is in order to then position something that's, you know, I'll start by saying, I'm probably looking at this differently. I might not understand you, but I'm thinking along these lines. And sometimes that allows the voice to be heard in ways that my younger, more direct statements did not. And so I'm, maybe that's obfuscating, but it's, it's just a zone that I'm still continuing to explore after 35 or 45 years of trying to figure out how to communicate with people. So I'd be really interested in continuing in some way the, the process of communication. Thank you, that's a great idea. You're reminding me of the, the I think, real incident where I'm forgetting who it was, Raymond Lowy or somebody, some designer was called in to fix something and he walks in and basically takes a wrench and, and bangs on a piece of equipment and fixes it and then sends an invoice for ten thousand dollars <throat> and uh, the boss is like what are you talking about and it's, it says like send me a more detailed invoice uh that wasn't worth it and he says like you know banging on the on the thing five cents knowing where to bang nine thousand nine hundred ninety nine dollars and ninety five cents <laughs> um ken i think we're uh, at that moment where you might just possibly have a poem for us i do um and before sure. before you do that i just want to appreciate that you do that for us and that you have such a deep well of poems that you reach into uh that you find things that are so good for us as a community and as a as a group so, so i just thank you very much for thank you thank you for this, this gift this gift you bring us regularly appreciate that a lot um I'm not sure if I'll be here next week. I'm flying out next Thursday to um, uh, Italy, Tuscany. I'll be gone for a couple of weeks. Um, if I if I'm not harried in the morning, I'll I'll show up on the call. If I am, I may not. But um, I was talking earlier about Carol Ann Duffy and um, about you know the the women's side of things. So this is a little poem about Mrs. Rip Van Winkle. I sank like a stone into the still deep waters of late middle age aching from head to foot. I took up food and gave up exercise. It did me good. And while he slept, I found some hobbies for myself, painting, seeing the sights I'd always dreamed about, 
the Leaning Tower, the pyramids, the Taj Mahal. I made a little watercolor of them all. But what was best, what hands down beat the rest, was saying a none too fond farewell to sex. Until the day I came home with this pastel of Niagara, and he was sitting up in bed rattling Viagra. <laughs> Awesome. <laughs> That's from a book called The World's Wife by um, Carol Ann Duffy, in which she just has all these Mrs. Mrs. Rip Van Winkle, Mrs. Darwin, Mrs. Sisyphus, you, you name a, a historical or mythological figure, and she's got a story from the woman's point of view. It's really quite a, a delightful read. I can't recommend it highly enough. Can you put that in the chat, Ken, so we can pick it up? I can. Ken, thank you. And uh, Carl, thanks for reminding me to put it to pin uh, Ken while he was reading the poem, but I didn't see your reminder until halfway through, but I'll try to train myself to do that. That was a nice idea as well. Um, there we go. Thanks, everybody. This has been a lovely call. Stories, many stories to tell from it. Uh, Judy, good idea about how we communicate. Um, I'll try to figure out how to frame that. Uh, anybody with ideas, uh, talk on the Town Square channel or on the OGM list or ping me or whatever else. I'm totally open to figuring out how how to how to maneuver that uh, the topic. Um, and with that, see you all Ciao. soon. Thank you.